The second step in the project ma management workflow is to conduct a feasibility analysis. Once you have the go-ahead from the approval committee on the system request, the next step is to gather more details about the proposed system. And we can do this by conducting a feasibility study. There are three things that we need to look at when we are trying to determine if a project is feasible. Technical feasibility, economic feasibility, and organizational feasibility. Technical feasibility is defined as the extent to which the system can be successfully designed, developed, and installed by the IT group. And there's a few things that can go into determining whether or not it is technical feas technically feasible. The first one is how familiar are you with the business area? The risks increase as the familiarity with the business model decrease. For instance, it's not much of a risk for Walmart to go into the tune-up shop or the tune-up business, but it would be highly risky for Walmart to want to publish a dating app. Another thing to consider in technical feasibility is how familiar are you with the technology itself. If the development team has never developed apps or um, have never used iPads or Twitter or PayPal, the risk goes up with the less familiarity with the technology itself. Obviously, another feature is the size. How many features does it have? How extensive of a build is it? And then finally is compatibility. How well does it fit with the current system? For example, maybe the client wants to do online billing, but they don't have the hardware. They don't have a modem and they don't have an internet connection. And so there's not a lot of compatibility without some additional effort. The second type of feasibility is economic feasibility, and that we're going to cover in a different video. For now, we're going to move on to organizational feasibility. Organizational feasibility is how well the system ultimately will it be accepted by the users and incorporated into the ongoing operations of the organization. And one way that we can do that is by conducting a stakeholder analysis where we identify each one of the individual stakeholders and the user groups of the system and then identifying how they will be impacted by the system. You can build the most amazing software system that is going to meet the needs of everybody in the organization, save the company tons of money, and increase their sales by a thousand percent. And if you can't get buy-in from the users, the people who are actually going to use it within the organization, then you'll never be able to realize those benefits. You'll never be able to bring those benefits to the company. So there's a couple of different ways that we can assess the organizational feasibility. And the first way is through strategic alignment. That means how well is the fit between the project and the actual business strategy? Does the project align with what the company values? Imagine for just a minute that you're developing some software for a rental car company and you find out that the maintenance team absolutely hates working on the computers. They love working on the cars, but they think it's a waste of time to have to key all of those things into the computers. What could we do to, to uh, get some buy-in from the maintenance crew? Maybe one of the things that we could do is implement handheld scanners so that they could scan barcodes to get all of the information that's necessary into the computers while they're working on the cars. Do you think something like this would improve the buy-in from the maintenance team? If we can improve the fit between the project and what they value most, we can definitely increase the buy-in. Another way we can assess an organizational feasibility is through a stakeholder analysis. We want to identify the different user groups within an organization and how they will be impacted by the implementation of the proposed software. A stakeholder is a person, a group, or an organization that can affect or be affected by the new system, though they might not actually be users of the system. They're called stakeholders because they have a stake or a vested interest in the success of the project and they will be impacted by the success or the failure of the project. So one of the stakeholders is the champion. The champion may or may not be the project sponsor. Remember the project sponsor is involved in the day-to-day -day activities. The champion, on the other hand, is going to support the project with things like their time and resources and maybe the political clout that they have within an organization. 
they would be explaining the benefits of the system to other people within the organization. Maybe they could do this by making presentations about the objectives of the project and the proposed benefits to the executives who would benefit directly from the system, or maybe create prototypes of the system to demonstrate its potential value. Again, just like with the project sponsor, the champion can be either one person or multiple people within the organization, preferably people in upper management who have some clout. Another type of stakeholder is the management team themselves. It's important to identify the way that management will be impacted by the system because they are going to be the ones who are helping their team members as they work through the process of implementing the new system. So they can make presentations to management about the objectives and the proposed benefits, uh, maybe market those benefits um, with memos and newsletters, um, certainly encourage the champion to talk to the individual employees about the benefits of the system and by showing the value and the benefit of the system to the end users they can encourage the users to implement and to use the system. The third type of a stakeholder are the system users. These are the end users. These are the people within the organization who will actually be using the software. It's critically important to have the system users on board. If we go back to the strategic alignment how well is the fit between the project and these system users? How well does it meet the needs and help alleviate some of the problems that they are currently having? How well does it implement new requirements that they would like to see in a new software system? Remember, you're going to have the best system in the world, but if the end users are not going to use it, the company is not going to see any of those benefits. There are several different ways that you can increase the buy-in from the system users. Um, one of them is getting reg regular feedback on the potential requirements. Um, in the next chapter, we're going to talk about some requirements gathering and how you can involve the end users in the process of determining what the system should be using. So the feasibility analysis allows us to identify the different user groups within the system, how they will be impacted by it, and what we can do to increase their buy-in to improve their satisfaction with the requirements of the proposed system. Another step in the feasibility analysis is determining if it is economically feasible by conducting a cost-benefit analysis, and that will be the subject of the next video.